Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And as regular viewers will know, sometimes we like to delve back into history on this show, and tonight is one of those times. So our guest tonight is Alicia Schult, and she is from the eight, uh, 1780s, correct? That is correct. You look wonderfully preserved for that period of time. I Thank must you. say, you look wonderful. I owe that to my cosmetics. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you are the proprietress, proprietress of an apothecary. So I think most people today don't know what an apothecary is. Can you describe that? That's actually a really good question. Um, an apothecary is a place where historically you could go to get all sorts of things. Um, everything from like um, oils, clove oil, maybe if you had a bad toothache you would need some clove oil, um, to even ground up pigments to make your rouge, or even medicines. You could say, hey, I'm really sick, this is what I have, I have a cough, can you make me something? And he would say, of course. So uh, I, sometimes you'll see drugstores that will say we're an apothecary. But is there a difference as a drugstore and apothecary? Are they really the same or is that just sort of a marketing hook? It's pretty much the same. By the 1920s, you would see drugstores and apothecaries starting to combine. And that's actually when you would see the cosmetic counters. Previous to that, you didn't really see the cosmetic counters inside the pharmacy. So you could get a cosmetics at apothecary, but you wouldn't get cosmetics at, at a pharmacy. pharmacy. So the pharmacies really were about medicine and try to treat illness. And the apothecary was a little more generalized than that? A little more generalized. True? And in fact, in the um, 1600s, cosmetics actually started out as medicinal, as medicines for your face. Um, so for example, when we talk about the white face paint mm -hmm. and how it had all this lead in, um, the reason that we actually started using this white face paint was because we had pox marks. We had diseases. We had to cover it up and make this artifice so we could look beautiful again. And that was the whole premise of the white face paint. So it actually started out as a medicinal, um, with a medicinal purpose. Even though it was filled with lead, and we now know Even it though it was filled with lead. And actually, that's kind of um, um, not really, everybody's like, oh, 18th century, 19th century, we still had a lot of lead in our cosmetics, and everybody was dying. By the 1600s, they actually were quite well aware that what lead was doing to those who were using it. And so they started posting um, pictures and all over that would have women at their toilets mm -hmm. and they would have like death standing right there <laughs> waiting for them so not to use this rouge because death is coming to get you. So it really started in the 1600s and then um, really took on by the mid to late 18th century where that push for natural cosmetics. And so that's where we get a lot of our recipes was for the natural cosmetics. So I have to ask the question that what prompted you to look at that particular period in history and what's the advantage of cosmetics that replicate something that's now 200 years old, um, or 150, uh, rather than just going to Walgreens or CVS and, and buying something today? It's a really interesting concept. When you think of the fads we have today, we have the natural fad kind of going today. Everybody's sort of getting back to nature. They're looking for more organic products. And ironically, in the 18th century, we had that same fad. So to c combine the two and kind of merge them into one and bring back those ancient recipes that have been lost or people have forgotten about, um, it's, really, it's, it's really actually combining and um, something that I think we, need, we really need to take a look at. So what lessons can we learn from, from this period? I mean, it, with cosmetics, I mean, what, what do we need to know? Um, well, basically for the look of the lady. In the early 18th century, we saw a lot of white face paint. And that was because we had the pox. And we didn't really have inoculations for that yet. So um, by the mid to late 18th century, we started having inoculations for the pox. And we would have um, doctors going around to small villages in France and, and talking to the fathers of these ladies and saying, you know, let's get your, doctors or, let's get your daughters inoculated so they can be beautiful and they don't have to worry about putting on this lead makeup and having their face all marked up and they can get a really good husband and they can advance themselves in society. Yeah. And so after they would wear down the fathers, then they would say, okay, we can inoculate my daughters. And so with this whole inoculation of the smallpox, we had this major shift to the natural cosmetics. And with that, we learned that, you know, it, not only is it, is it good for you, it's healthy for you, it actually, it, it's really beautiful once it's applied in the correct manner. 
So what got you interested in this period? I've always been really interested in um, herbs and plants. I think I was just born with that. I've always been interested in history. Um, my father would tell stories about his grandma and how she would use various plants. He never actually tried to make what she would make. Mm -hmm. um, but then I'd always say, oh, Dad, look, you know, there's some yarrow. And didn't you tell that story about great grandma? And so um, it, it was always really a fascination, a fascination for me from the beginning. And um, I always had books. I even tried to make my dad some aftershave once. <laughs> But he never used it, so, <laughs> yeah, so. Uh, he wasn't quite sure what was in that Yeah, thing, right? he, he didn't think it smelled too good, so. Uh, well, uh, you know, that's why you guys <laughs> use aftershave is for the <laughs> exactly. smell, right? Exactly, exactly. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the era. You're from the 1780s, mm -hmm. and this outfit that you're wearing, um, it, which uh, actually our audience didn't get the benefit that I did of watching this outfit be put together, which took quite some time, <laughs> including the hair, right? Uh, so. Describe what, what you're wearing and why you would be dressed this way. Um, well, basically, I'm wearing an Italian gown, and that doesn't mean that it came from Italy. It's just the type of style of gown where you have a very low point in the back. And this whole gown is hand-sewn, um, petticoat, everything is hand-sewn. By you or by someone? By me, yeah. Nice. <laughs> yep, by me. Um, I really take pride in trying to... Um, research and replicate history. So even if I'm not working with the cosmetics and I'm making myself a gown, it's really important to me to use the correct historical manner with draping, hand sewing, picking out the correct fabrics, um, not putting too much trim on it. If I'm going to trim it, it needs to be the natural trim, not just running off to the nearest fabric store and grabbing that. And so I really look at what fits my persona as well. Um, as we own an apothecary shop, I want to look really nice for my customers. Historically, we would be a high-end apothecary shop. Um, we have documentation of women owning them, owning cosmetic shops in the 18th century. It wasn't something that was done a lot, but it was done. And, um, you mean it, was, it wasn't done a lot that there were not a lot of women who ran these shops? That were specifically okay. proprietress, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you'd have to kind of camouflage it under your husband or depending on what mm -hmm. type of relationship you had. But it was something that, that was done. Um, and some of these women would take their wares to um, the wealthy ladies and sit down with them in their own homes and show them how to apply it. Other um, other proprietors would say, would, would put in advertisements and they would say, you know, our products are only found in, at Center Street and if any other products with our name show up, you know, beware, those are falsified. Um, you could technically buy a pot of used rouge on the street. Used rouge. <laughs> used rouge. That doesn't sound very appealing. What yeah. would be the sales pitch that would get someone to buy that? It would be a lower class who wants, even today, we're always, we're always trying to obtain that the highest look that we can or the highest class that we can. If, if um, you see um, you know, a, a lower, in, like in the East if you were lower class and a woman, you would want to try and look your best to try and walk up that social ladder. So cosmetics, you want it to look beautiful. Um, the, the books that I have, for example, this is an 18th century, an original 18th century um, book with recipes in. And cooking like for food or recipes oh, for these for, kinds for of medical recipes and apothecary and cosmetics, yes. And in the beginning, they will give you this whole spiel about, you know, why these are natural cosmetics and they're so beautiful for you and you need to use them because you want to look beautiful too. Mm -hmm. So it's the same commercialism that we see today, just done a different way. Just People think this is all new. It's, it's not over two hundred years all. old. Right. Yeah. And so if you know, if I was um, a working woman or a woman of lower class and I, I really cared about my appearance, I would buy that pot of rouge, but I don't know what's in that pot of rouge. That's the only thing because you never know when this person was selling it, what it was made from. And so that's where you get the people who would mix lesser quality materials, dangerous materials, and then sell it at a high price of high quality materials. Same thing happens today. Sure. I mean, we see that even, even today, some goods coming from overseas are tainted with, uh, in some cases, something that's toxic. Correct. And you don't know until people start getting sick or dying from it. Mm -hmm. um, now, how would someone in, in your position in 1780 learn this trade? I mean, especially since women were not typically proprietresses, how would you, how would you figure out how to do this? Um, well, there could be a couple ways. I like the idea of um, you know, having your father 
being there and then you're just kind of growing up in it or um, then you would you know you would marry and then your husband would take over and then something would happen to your husband and then you would get the the business so um, there was in the 18th century um, there was less focus on actually educating women but more mm -hmm. so educating them in the manner of um, sewing or how to you know husbandry uh, things or, like that or how to catch a husband so, <laughs> right exactly um, and so it's just growing up in it or be, being an apprentice um, there is a woman apprentice blacksmith in Colonial Williamsburg at the moment they found so it does happen they do mm -hmm. find um, examples throughout history every once in a while of of women women actually being able to uh, hold a, a high standing job so Let's talk a little bit about what you actually make. Now, now you make everything that's here is something that you sell, and your store is primarily accessible through Etsy, the online yes, store. Yes, that is correct. correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so, what? And actually, I think I hope we have the URL. But um, what is the actual uh, web address for? Okay, so the web address has three T's in. That's just the way they did it. I couldn't change it after that. So it's L I T T T L E little bits b i t s dot etsy dot com little bits with three t's little bits really with little three bits, right? t's right and that was the name i was given as a nickname when i first started into the living history um, it, it, where i was so little and i was the only one going cuz my my parents really weren't interested in history my grandma mm. was mm. um so i would go with my girlfriends and we would just hang out and i was called little bits cuz i was so tiny doing it by myself <laughs> So then well, in, in, <laughs> in high school, my art teacher said, well, you need to come up with a name for your business. And I said, I don't know. And so we came up with the name Little Bits. And it's been a long time, and it's stuck. So. And the LBCC Little Bits Cosmetic Company? Yep, Little Bits Cosmetic Company. And it actually used to be Little Bits Clothing Company because I used to um, hand sew, hand draft for museums, forts, and um, reenactors around the world. So where is the market? I mean, I do know about reenactors, and there's all sorts of people who reenact all different eras of history. Um, but where is the market for these products that you're making now? Is this strictly for that same clientele of reenactors, or are there others who would take this and say, well, hey, this is works today. Let's do this. Right. We actually have uh, quite a huge base for clientele. Um, we have very large, obviously, the historical reenactors and, and the living historians, um, but also it's those who are concerned with um, natural, good, healthy cosmetics, um, organic cosmetics. We are we only order our um, ingredients from certified organic companies and fully sustainable companies. So we really care about the environment, and we have that that demographic too. So let's talk a little bit about some of the things you have here. This is a, it's certainly a colorful display. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and there's there's lots of things here now. Actually, before we even get started in this, I'm uh, I think that I'm not sure the cameras can see, but on the floor we have this other chest of things, and we have two implements that look much more like implements of torture than <laughs> anything else. So, uh, what are those uh, particular deals? Okay, let me grab this. Let me grab them for you. So these are the two that um, I believe you're talking yes, about. Yes, yes, those are the ones I'm referring okay, to. Okay, so. Um, not only do we do historical cosmetics and apothecary, that's, that's our, you know, our primary business, but with doing that, we also learn how to use our historical apothecary and cosmetic goods. And so we need to teach everyone the exact procedure on you know, how they should be used. Um, specifically for your hair, how I dress my hair, um, you need to use a pomatum and powder to do that. To which get, is from the era. Right? Which is from the era, correct. And then you would use these implements to get your curls. Um, this is, it's actually pretty heavy. It's, it's very awkward. Well, it's cast iron. Probably. It's cast iron, right? That is a tool from the 18th century, and they are very rare to come by. Um, it's called a, an iron. Today we call it a papillote iron, and it's for making papillote curls. So when you think of like papillote, you think of like a fish wrapped in paper. <laughs> Actually, I don't think of anything when I okay. hear papillote, but I'll take your word for it. But it's basically the same method. You would wrap your curls in paper, mm -hmm. and you would heat this implement up, and then you would put it on a curl, 
and hold it there and the palmatum soaks the curl, heats oh, it up. And forms it to this. And forms it up and then you can let go and it just sticks there with the paper on. Once you do your whole head like that and it's all cooled, you pull the little tab of the paper and it comes out in these beautiful sausage curls. And I think you see that more maybe in um, the Civil War period where these young mm -hmm. girls have these beautiful curls right. hanging down. But towards and that the, wasn't natural. They had to work on that. They right? had to work. They had yeah. to work very hard. Yep. And yeah. towards the 18th century, that was really important too, with your big hedgehog styles, where you had just massive amounts of hair. And so, uh, in the 70s, Farrah Fawcett uh, was <laughs> oh, big hair as well, right? right? <laughs> Different take on yes, it. Yes. Same idea. Yes, definitely. This is fascinating. So, how how do you find these tools? Um, I, I'm actually I don't really know how I find <laughs> them. To be honest, I. I have this idea of, well, I'm researching this at the moment and we really need to educate on how to use these products, so I really need to find a 18th century papillote iron. And then I'll search eBay, or we, we do a lot of antiquing mm -hmm. all around the state, various other states, and then all of a sudden, randomly, a very, very, very rare papillote iron from the 18th century will just show up. It's, it's like so willing it into it existence, is, It's right? like it's meant to be. <laughs> um, and this, this is one of my favorite tools. So um, we have an actual one like this from the 18th century in a museum. I believe this is 19th century. But what's really interesting about this is it folds up. This is a curling iron. Hmm. And so you can take it with you. Ah. You can heat it up. But for traveling, it folds up. That is so clever, and this is from, you think, the 19th century? I think it's from the 19th century. We yeah. have an example of a fold-up curling iron and papillote iron um, from the 18th century in, I believe it's the Met Museum, or, or it might be the um, uh, Victorian Albert Museum. These are so cool. But <laughs> I just have to tell it's you. fascinating. I, I have quite a collection of um, historical hair implements, and then we do make videos, post them on YouTube. Um, using them and if you want to check out the papillote iron video it is on our YouTube channel and that's little bits at YouTube also with three T's correct yes. <laughs> yeah that's now the trademark now that is our trademark, trademark. Right. yeah yep and so, so so what else do we have here we have a whole case full of things when we whenever we replicate a recipe we basically have three different categories of replication number one would be completely historically accurate we didn't have to change anything um, and so even the ingredients are still available in the form correct. they would have been available 200 years ago correct exactly yep and this is a really great example this is a raspberry pomatum um, from 1860 so civil war time mm -hmm. period and that again would be put into your hair and um, you know you could use powder it's basically same as the 18th century where People are like, wow, you guys don't shower in the 18th century. That's really gross. <laughs> but, but really. Um, well, they didn't have many showers. They in didn't really have a lot century. of showers, no. But sponge baths were very, very popular. And it's something, again, like the cosmetics that's overlooked. Pe people actually bathed quite often in the 18th century. It's just not really talked about. Um, but for washing your hair, you would use your pomatum and then you would use your powder. And by putting the powder on top of the pomatum, the powder not only sticks, but when you rub your board bristle brush through it, it mm -hmm. cleans your hair and it makes it so soft and beautiful and worth the, the hundred strokes. So rather than soap and water, they're really using this um, pomatum Correct. and powder, mm -hmm. which then there's no further hair products necessary because you've cl right. cleaned and conditioned and done all that stuff right. and now you're done, right? And the best part is the pomatum is made from different fats. Um, Animal fats. Animal fats, okay. correct. Yep. And so people think that, oh, I don't want to put animal fat on my hair. But until you realize with your normal shampoos and conditioners, they're actually not really healthy for your hair. They're stripping your hair of a lot of um, needed minerals and vitamins. And that fat in there, that tallow, actually um, puts those back into your hair. And that's one way, one reason your hair gets so shiny and healthy. And I, I'm fascinated by that. So rather than soap and water, you're cleaning your hair with something that yep. is really kind of cleaning and adding things and to it. And they don't smell bad at all. They're they're scented with oils. It smells great. So it smells so this yeah. one is is rosemary. Rosemary is very popular in the Civil War time period to scent scent a lot of products with. Wow. So um, what are some of the things that we have up here at the top? These look more like ingredients. Yeah, I thought it would be really great to show what an apothecary 
what, what types of things the apothecary would have. This is a mortar and pestle from the mm -hmm. early 19th century. Um, it's very, very heavy. <laughs> Again, cast iron. <laughs> cast probably. iron, yeah. yep. And these are the various types of jars. I included lavender. Lavender has been popular throughout history, not only as you know, something that smells really great, you can cook with it, but also um, for calming, and it, it's wonderful for healing any sort of open wounds, um, any sort of like itching for mosquitoes. Bugs don't like lavender, so you, you can uh, you kind of use it as a bug repellent. Um, lavender just has all these uses, and so an apothecary would have carried lavender, probably went through quite a bit of it. So I'm fascinated by that because we're so, at least from my perspective, we're so used to now seeing uh, highly chemical-based products that do these things. Um, and we're thinking, oh, well, gee, this is wonderful because it's modern chemistry, better living, all that. But you're finding that, that in fact, 200 years ago, long before the chemical industry really existed, there were natural products that did the same thing. Correct. And apparently pretty well. Correct. Um, we have had some, I always love hearing from our customers all the wonderful stories that they have of how they healed this and how they healed that. And um, so I had one, I had, a, I had a cowboy, an actual real Texan mm. cowboy, who fell off his horse and the horse fell on him, I guess. Mm. And so he wasn't going to go to the doctor, but he wasn't sure if it was broken. But his it had it was his or leg or his his ankle, I guess, and it had mm -hmm. swollen up so bad, and it was so black and blue that he obviously couldn't walk on it, and he said he couldn't fit his boot on, and that's mm. what frustrated him the most. So um, I sent him our salve. I sent him our healing apothecary salve, right here, and this was a collection of a whole bunch of historical recipes. Um, a lot of them throughout history are kind of the same. They, they reuse the same ingredients. And so sometimes when we, when we come across those, we call them historically inspired mm. because they're not exactly one recipe. We have a whole bunch of recipes added. Or if you can't find so. the exact ingredient, then it would be historically inspired. Exactly. Gotcha. Exactly. Um, in that case, um, I'll get back to the story in just a second, mm. but in that case, for example, um, spermaceti. Spermaceti would be found in almost all pomades, um, any types of salves. Spermaceti comes from the whale, and it's it's a um, like a waxy substance. Uh, it is illegal now, so you know, oh, which is good. We want to save the whales. Because the whales are protected. Right. <laughs> right, but you know, for historical purposes, we have to come up with something that um, is chemically the same um, makeup. But, as with that. The, but without being manufactured in a chemical lab. Correct, and it right. has to be all natural. And, and organically certified. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, uh, we're lucky because jojoba oil, which is actually also a wax or an oil, depending on how you get it, um, actually has almost the same compound. It doesn't, when you compare spermaceti with um, jojoba, even though it's almost chemically the same, mm -hmm. there's still a little bit of difference. So you're still getting close, but you're not getting exact. But sometimes we just can't do that. So how much chemistry do you have to know as someone who runs an apothecary? Um, <laughs> you have to know a lot. You have to know, you have to know how to, um, more than chemistry probably, you have to know how to take um, various measurements, historical measurements, and translate them into what they would be today, or find those historical scales, which I have quite a few of them at home, so we know exactly what we're measuring out. Um, there's a there's a lot of information and knowledge that you you have to have in order to reproduce these. Do you recipes. have a background in chemistry, or did you have to learn all of this when you decided to do this? I decided to learn it when <laughs> when I decided to, that I was going to go into this. It's fascinating to me that that and and how how long have you been doing this? Um, I, specifically doing the historical path care and cosmetics. It's been about three and a half years now. Okay. I think. So um, and. and the source of information, of course, we fortunately live not in the 1780s, but in the age of the <laughs> internet, where information is plentiful. Right. Um, but is it difficult to go through, I mean, when trying to educate yourself in particular, um, and I assume you're mostly self-educated on this. Uh, um, right? Pretty much. So uh, how are you able to distinguish between good information and questionable on the net? It's always, well, I have... Um, I have degrees in history and broadfield social science and museums and anthropology. Um, and so, it, you know, we were always taught to go back to the source. Mm -hmm. So just because I see something written up that says, hey, there was red powder in the 18th century for your hair, um, that's not good enough. 
I have to go back to that original source, and I, I have to document Just like it a there. historian, go to the original Correct. material and find out what they really said and what they were describing. Correct. So do you ever um, run into questions or issues with the FDA, the Federal Drug Administration? Are there, is, does anything you do fall into their purview? Um, no, because we're such a small business, and if they actually do come asking questions, we have all of our paperwork, and we can show where all of our products or all of our ingredients come from, and those are all FDA certified companies. So we're we're good there. Okay. Yeah, no problems. Um, so I'm anxious to find out what happened to the the cowboy whose horse fell. Oh, in right. <laughs> so he sent me some pictures. Um, said he was applying it twice a day. And within three days, the black and blue had turned into kind of a yellow green, and within five days, it was gone. And and we're talking most of his foot to most of his um, his uh, way above his ankle was bruised. So that and that that's what made me think of the FDA. I'm thinking, well, that's being used for what is essentially a medicinal purpose. Mm -hmm. um, uh, is there ever any question about having to you know where do you, where do you draw the line between? prescribing something as medicine versus saying, well, hey, this is make you feel better or look better. Or, right. Uh, yeah, we technically can't say that we're prescribing medicine for you. Um, we can say, do your research. Uh, this is what we've researched for these herbs. So, um, but, you know, here, please look it up. Do your own research. So. And you can sort of suggest, say, well, some people have had some sort of success with this is that exactly that, you can say that right? exactly yeah so you know from from that standpoint we're just a really fun company who is delved into the historical products to see what it was like we're not trying to like tote any sort of healing or that people shouldn't go see doctors because doctors are good and we need doctors <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah but uh. And there's nothing here that like will cure cancer or anything like that. Um, right? No, I'm still working on that. No, yes. Yeah. Yeah, let us know when, when, you, when you get that. Um, so, is there anything else here? You've got a, a guide here to sewing your own, right? Is this uh, oh. sewing your own clothing? Yep. Some of what you've done. Yep. Here? Um, when I was uh, first getting into the historical clothing, the historical draping, um, in the historical communities, we had a lack of authentic um, patterns for for clothing and for stays, which you need the proper undergarments, so your and, and I noticed you've got about 50 of those undergarments <laughs> right. right now, right? So I watched the production back in the green room. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I really wanted to um, put something out there that would help people when they get just a regular store pattern for stays. It's A, mm -hmm. probably not historical. There's not really much history in there. And B, like any sewing pattern, once you actually get it made, you're going to have to make adjustments. And for sewing um, stays, which is your, your undergarment, mm -hmm. it's a pretty important part of your outfit, you need to have a well-fitting pair of stays. Great fitting pair of stays, you can work all day, you don't have any problems whatsoever. Um, but if your stays are ill-fit, uh, they can cause problems or, you know, you can get sick if you just don't feel good or they can um, hug on your hips and that leaves black and blues. Don't restrict your breathing. Right, exactly. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to put myself out there as a pattern maker. People would send me their measurements and I can historically draft them stays. And so they can have a pattern that will fit them that will be perfect um, and, and they don't have to do that. They just have to make it. Well, Alicia, believe it or not, we're already out of time. That was <laughs> fascinating. I, I, I love having guests like you on because this is something I know nothing about until you come on and tell me. So I want to thank you so much for Thanks. being here, being my guest. Mm -hmm. And thank you for joining us again on Public Perspective. We've been visiting with Alicia Schult, and uh, she's told us all about what it means to be uh, to make cosmetics for the, uh, the 1780s and today. So um, I'm Kevin McDermott. You've been watching Public Perspective. Uh, you can find us on line at uh, publicperspective.tv and you can find us on the air at Comcast Channel 19 every Saturday night at 8. So until next time, thank you and good night. Okay, so uh